We are going to focus on changes in Gibbs free energy in this course. One reason is because we operate in a constant pressure environment, which makes it easier to measure the change in enthalpy of a process, which is a part of the definition of Gibbs free energy. First, we will focus on single component systems. The image presented here is the phase diagram of carbon dioxide. Based on this plot, if you were given a pressure and a temperature, you would be able to determine the phase of carbon dioxide. This figure is based on the Gibbs free energy of the solid, liquid, and gas phases of CO2 as various different pressures and temperatures. When discussing if it is spontaneous for a given phase to form, it would be tempting to use the total Gibbs free energy. For example, for an ice cube floating in a large bath of water at 0 degrees Celsius, the total Gibbs free energy of the ice is smaller than the Gibbs free energy of the water since there is so much more water. However, the water will not freeze since the solid and liquid phase are in equilibrium at 0 degrees Celsius. We must use a quantity that is independent of the total amount of the substance. This issue is solved by using the molar Gibbs free energy. We can still write for a change in Gibbs free energy that the total number of moles times the molar Gibbs free energy of that phase, in this case denoted with a 2, minus the total number of moles times the molar Gibbs free energy of the second phase, in this case denoted with a 1. We can distribute out the number of moles so that the difference is simply between the molar Gibbs free energy. We can conclude that a change in molar Gibbs free energy being less than 0 still indicates a spontaneous process. Here is now an example where we're going to use the difference in molar Gibbs free energy between two phases to predict whether which phase will spontaneously occur at various temperatures. We're going to assume that we're going to be at ambient um, pressure being one bar. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the change in molar Gibbs free energy between water and ice at 0 degrees Celsius minus 10 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. And what we're going to use to do this calculation to find the difference in molar Gibbs free energy is the molar enthalpy and the entropy of fusion, where we're given the two numbers, the 6.01 kilojoules per mole for the molar enthalpy of fusion. And then we've got the 22.0 joules per Kelvin per mole for the entropy of fusion, basically changing ice to water. So the reaction that we're going to be looking at is H2O solid being ice is going to H2O liquid. And the equation we're going to use to describe this process to predict spontaneity is the change in Gibbs free energy. In this case, it's going to be the molar Gibbs free energy is going to be equal to the molar enthalpy minus the temperature times the entropy, or the change in entropy of this process being the melting of ice. And we already know intuitively what's going to happen at the three temperatures that we've already outlined. At zero degrees Celsius, the system's going to be at equilibrium, so we expect the change in Gibbs free energy to be zero. At minus 10 degrees Celsius, we expect that it's going to be ice is what's going to spontaneously be formed, so that means then that the reverse reaction is going to be the spontaneous process. And at positive 10 degrees Celsius, we know that liquid water is the, the expected phase that would be present, and so we would expect then the Gibbs free energy would tell us that the forward reaction is spontaneous. So let's now calculate these values at these three temperatures. So at minus 10 degrees Celsius, we have delta G is equal to, well, using the equation delta H minus TDS, I'm just going to plug in the numbers. The delta H for this process is 6.01. We're going to subtract off minus 10 plus 273.15. Multiply that by 22.0 times 10 to the minus 3. And so the reason why I'm choosing to write this times 10 to the minus 3 is because, again, remember the units are given in joules per Kelvin per mole for the entropy, and for the enthalpy of fusion, it's kilojoules per mole. And so I'm just making sure that my numbers are in the same units, being kilojoules. And when I evaluate this expression, what I end up with is 0 0.22 kilojoules per mole. And so just as what was expected, we expect that this tells us that the reverse reaction is the spontaneous reaction, meaning that we expect that ice will be the spontaneous process at negative 10 degrees Celsius. And just taking a second to be reminded of the sign convention, these numbers that are given in the problem, the 
molar enthalpy of fusion and the entropy of fusion, those are all basically to describe what happens for the forward reaction. And so for a Gibbs free energy for spontaneous, spontaneous reaction, we would expect to get a negative number or a number less than zero to be spontaneous for the forward direction. And so because this is a positive number, then that means then the forward reaction is not spontaneous, it's the reverse direction, which is spontaneous. Now moving on to the second temperature, if we look at this at zero degrees Celsius, again I'm going to plug in delta G is equal to, and I use the same number, 6.01 minus, and in this case it's going to be zero plus 273.15, and that's going to be times 22.0 times 10 to the minus 3. We end up with a delta G being equal to 0. And again, we know that a delta G being equal to 0 means that we're in equilibrium. And again, this is what we would expect. At 0 degrees Celsius, we have the forward and reverse reaction being the solid and the liquid phase being in equilibrium. So the final temperature we're going to do this calculation at is 10 degrees Celsius. And so again, I'm going to write delta G, that's equal to 6.01 minus 10 plus 273.15 times 22.0 times 10 to the minus 3. And so now I'm going to get a delta G being equal to negative 0.22 kilojoules per mole. And so again, this means that the forward direction is spontaneous. which is what we would expect, because we would expect that at 10 degrees Celsius, that water would be the spontaneously formed phase. So taking a step back, what I just want to highlight at this point is this is how phase diagrams are formed. We just do this analysis of what is the spontaneously formed phase by looking at the various different reactions between the different phases that can occur. This, of course, is a much simplified example because we're only looking at the solid and the liquid phase at 10, minus 10 degrees, 0 degrees Celsius, and 10 degrees Celsius, and we're looking at this at one bar of pressure. And what this all says to us is that, and it's something that we already knew, that as we increase the temperature, we then shift which phase would form spontaneously. And so if we were to do this for many different pressures over many different temperatures, we can start to build up a phase diagram where we can then plug in a certain pressure and a temperature and that we would be then be able to say just by reading off of the figure what is the spontaneously formed phase.